So welcome everybody um, to the Riverside Magnet School um, info session. <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen with you now. We're gonna go through a PowerPoint. Let me just hold a second. Sorry about that. Okay, so welcome to our Riverside Magnet School Info Session 2020. Um, my name is Casey Gaheen. I'm the Studio and Community Coordinator here at Riverside. Um, thank you again for all attending. Um, we will be monitoring the chat box. So if you do have any questions along the way, please feel free to um, drop your question in there. And um, Ms. Mish, one of our first grade teachers will be, um, she can shoot a, a quick answer if it's, if it's appropriate, or we will answer the questions at the end. Um, if you wouldn't mind also putting your name and introducing yourself in the chat room and also saying what town you're from. Um, so, this is our agenda for the day. Um, we're gonna start off with um, introductions. I'm gonna tell you who's here with us. Um, and then we're gonna hear a welcome from our principal, Mrs. Kelly. Uh, we'll go through our PowerPoint presentation and then we have a question and answer at the end. Um, today we have um, a pre-K teacher with us, um, Miss Lindsay Simone. Um, we also have a first grade teacher with us, uh, Miss Callie Mish. We have uh, Principal Kelly here with us. Um, and we have two parent representatives here to share their experiences um, with their children uh, coming to RMS and being a part of our community. So I'm going to pass it over to Mrs. Kelly for her um welcome introduction so welcome everyone uh the picture that you see here shows uh mrs kelly gelino who is our assistant principal alongside of me um as the principal and um i'm the younger one there in that picture <laughs> so we are so appreciative of you coming out to um, get some information about our school. Some of you may already know about us, um, but just to give a little bit of little bit of um, background, we are in our eighth year at Riverside. We began as Goodwin College Early Childhood Magnet School back in 2013, and we were pre-K and kindergarten only at that point. We then grew with that kindergarten class as they moved along in the years, um, moved on to first grade. We, we were then going to move into pre-K through grade three. And within a couple of years, we were moving pre-K through grade five. So our fifth graders who began with us as kindergartners um, just moved on in 2019 and um we we continue we continue to grow in many ways and particularly with uh the pandemic we've learned lots and we've becoming so we've become so much more adept in, in terms of our remote um learning i think the the biggest thing right now for us as riverside magnet school is that your children would have the opportunity to come in at pre-k three and then move right on through the system into our middle grades our connecticut river academy middle grades beginning in sixth grade and then right on into connecticut uh, river academy high school during high school our scholars have the opportunity to take uh, college courses over at goodwin university so we have that that pipeline from pre-k three right up through Goodwin University. Um, so that's something we're really proud of. Our middle school program just began this year. So last year's fifth graders, we were able to move right in as sixth graders. Um, you will learn lots, I think, from, from this particular PowerPoint and those that are with us. So welcome. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Um, 
so here's a little information about Riverside, some quick hits. Um, we are located in East Hartford. Uh, we do serve children from um, around 40 towns. Um, and our school hours are um, drop off begins at 820, school begins at 840. Uh, the, so the school day is 840 to 355. Um, we do offer a four fee after school program um, that we do um, have here located at school. Um, transportation is offered for children, uh, pre-K Hartford students, and then all children kindergarten through fifth grade uh, within the RESCO transportation zone. Um, so um, that if you live with outside the zone, outside that zone, um, busing is not available. Um, we do also offer um, a food service so children can opt in to purchase breakfast um, and or lunch. Um, and there is a free and reduced uh, lunch opportunities also. So what makes Riverside uh, so unique? Uh, Mrs. Kelly mentioned our preschool to university pathway with uh, Goodwin University. So you start here uh, as a pre-K-3 student and um, by the time that you get to Connecticut River Academy, um, the high school, uh, you can start taking uh, college classes when you're in the, um, uh, your junior year. Um, and then you can go on and continue to graduate from Goodwin University with your bachelor's. Um, our learners, our scholars here have uh, voice and choice in their learning. Um, we do a lot of hands-on projects, um, project-based learning opportunities, and have one-to-one -one devices. Um, our uh, children in third grade, third through fifth, have um, the opportunity to join orchestra and choir. Um, Lindsay? Hi, I'm Lindsay Simone, and I'm one of the preschool teachers here at Riverside. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Reggio Emilia approach. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the Reggio Emilia approach started in Italy uh, during World War II when they did not have uh, the opportunity for children to go to school. So families created a school. Um, for children to be able to attend. And uh, myself and Callie Mish, who's also on this um, call, had the opportunity to go to Reggio a few years ago, which was really inspiring and allowed us to bring the approach back here to Riverside and really be able to explain to other teachers and um, staff how we could bring the Reggio inspiration um, into our school. So the Reggio approach is an inspiration and not a curriculum. Um, one of the biggest takeaways is that we cannot replicate what they're doing in Italy, um, but we can utilize our local resources within our own community um, because our families are our children's first teachers. Um, the actual educators in the school are the second teachers, and then our environment is considered the third teacher. So really allowing children to dictate their learning based off the interest um, that they have. Their learning is ever evolving. Um, so something else that we talk about is the hundred languages of children, that all learners, just like adults, um, attain knowledge differently. And so allowing children to bring um, the way that they learn and explore uh, to the forefront of how we are helping them to increase information um, in areas that they really um, show interest in. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of these other aspects of the approach, which are relationships, student voice, the project approach, and purposeful uh, materials in some of the following slides. So starting with relationships, as I said, one of the biggest um, parts about uh, this approach is families being the first teacher, um, educators being the second teacher, and uh, the environment being the third teacher. So in order for us to be able to help children learn, we have to have a strong foundation and relationship with them. Um, and when we talk about relationships, obviously we're talking about relationships with um, children, but we're also talking about 
um, helping children to formulate relationships with their peers, with adults, and then um, for our staff to have relationships with families. Um, so creating those trusting relationships is the foundation of any learning, um, and we take that very seriously here. Um, some of the biggest takeaways usually when we have, um, we go to marketing fairs is that, um, you know, oftentimes myself or Callie will end up sitting on the floor with the children, um, talking and playing with them while um, Mrs. Kelly or Mrs. Gaheen or another staff member are, are answering family questions. Um, and we think that, you know, building that that initial um, interaction with children is is super important. So in order for children to take risks and um, be able to accept feedback and be able to grow and move forward, we really need to start with building with building that um, with building that relationship. Um, the other the other big part is um, in our classroom building that community and having um, a social context of a group and really um, building off of one another and co-collaborating, which will lead into the next slide about uh, student voice and choice. Voice and choice plays a really um, big part at Riverside. And one thing, um, when parents usually come in and tour, they say that they can see how we really um, focus on voice and choice. So I'm hoping that in this slideshow we can um, show that as well as possible. Um, it is a little bit different than typical, so I am a little bit nervous, so I'm sorry if I sound redundant. Um, but one way that we show voice and choice is by displaying student work. But students have get to choose the work that they find special or that's important to them. So throughout our hallways, even now without visitors, we're still um, able to have students displaying work and it's work that's special to them. And sometimes in the older grades, they'll write what makes this work special to them. In the younger grades, it might be a picture of them holding up something that they drew. So it's a photograph of them as well. Um, even our online learners who aren't currently in school are still displaying some of their um, favorite pieces of work by having QR codes for their seesaw things or teachers are actually printing out the activities that they've done so that we're able to show student voice throughout our school. And our cur currently our students are the only ones wandering in the halls, but they're able to see their peers and how important the work is, which then helps them have pride in their own work. Um, voice and choice also takes a smaller role that might not seem as big, but it is, I think it's something very important. Um, it's just simple opportunities for students to do different things. For example, um, in years past, sitting at the carpet is a large, um, activity that we do throughout the day. They have morning meeting, different group meetings, so students will be gathered at the carpet. And students will have the choice to sit different ways. And they'll even invent some of their own ways. Like um, we have like mountain, which is your knees up, um, sitting on your knees, crisscross, your legs straight out. But a couple of years ago, a few of my students came up with different ways to sit and they called it like bird and they would make like a pose and sit that way. And that was an option for students to have. So they're creating their own things. I know, um, in one of the teachers in first grade's classrooms, they create different um, signals for ways to communicate so they're not interrupting to ask for things like water or bathroom. And they learn um, they learned the American Sign Language signs for these things, and then they kind of use that or create their own and come up with simple signals that the teacher in the class know that um, means that. And those signals have also been able to be used this year with virtual learning. Um, a lot of times we'll do the connection sign, which you'll see in preschool to fifth grade, um, students will make connections with people. And as an adult, I've noticed me and some of the Zooms with people being like, and I'm like, oh, I'm with adults now. They don't know what this means. But just displaying those, connect, uh, those connections and then those symbols really gives the students their opportunity for their voice and choice. Um, Mrs. Simone had talked about risk taking and the importance of that. And that's something that we really pride ourselves on, but trying to talk about the safety issues with it. So one of the things in my class this year um, we're at our desks a lot more often than in years typical. So how can we create those simple opportunities for students to sit in different styles? And it's sitting in your chair backwards is something we've created this year, talking about how we have to be safe with it. Sitting on our desks at opportunities are something that we do. But again, how you can be safe with it. So it's not like crazy risks, but definitely risks that students can take. We weigh our options. We talk about how to be safe. 
um, in pre-K and kindergarten, we have centers in our classroom. And in years past, students could use their voice and choice for how many students are allowed in a center at a time. This year, unfortunately, it's a little more structured with um, COVID precautions, but we're hoping that's something we can eventually get back to in future years, like just allowing them to help create the rules of our school and our climate. One um, really fun thing that helped us create such a strong student voice and choice throughout the whole school is a couple of years ago, we did not have a school mascot. So we did a school-wide um, brainstorm of what object, uh, what things could be our mascots. We had, I mean, really strange things like hot dogs, unicorns, dogs. Um, the older grades definitely took it to a more like they wanted a bulldog because um, those are like tough and like things of that nature. And then once we had some main categories, the teachers went through some of the students' choices to come up with some main categories, like hot dogs probably wouldn't be a school mascot. We came up with a few categories and the whole school voted, and then Eagles won, which also happened to be what the high school had, so it did actually work really well, but it was based off student voice and choice. Our voice and choice also leads us to something that is special at our school, which is our projects. Um, we do small projects and long-term projects. So Mrs. Kahina is gonna, yeah, I was gonna say she's on the next slide. And you can see just some different ways that we demonstrate projects at our school. We, every year, have done some sort of project night. Um, at the beginning, it used to be more of a community-based, so it was like every classroom had blocks when we were a pre-K, kindergarten, or first grade school. So how blocks played such an important role, and you could see the different ways projects were in with the blocks. Um, last year, I believe it was, we did more of a focused project night with grade levels and each grade, what their major project had been, how each class took a little bit of a different spin on it, and students got to walk throughout the whole, with their parents, got to walk throughout the whole school and really see what's happening in kindergarten, what's happening in preschool, what's happening in fifth grade, and every grade is favorite pod our school set up in pods was the preschool one, which was blocks, but it just goes to show how they can learn from each other, how they really wanted to get in and manipulate those things. Our fifth graders, it was a little more generalized, so they got to show off their knowledge as an expert and teach us about their projects, which in all of the older grades, but I know fifth grade, it was very like the kids are so excited. They came back to school the next day and we're like, the fifth graders taught me that. Um, and we really, with our long-term projects, it's not the end product that's important, it's the whole process. It's from brainstorming and um, webbing our ideas to the culminating lesson. Some of our projects could take months. Some of them are short-term and last a week, a day. Um, they might change their format a little bit. It might change our directions. Um, in first grade this year, we are studying how-to books. So we've written different ways to how to inform people on how to do things. And we created pizza boxes and wrote how to make a pizza and students um, then got to make their own construction paper pizza. In years past, they got to make real pizza, which is a little bit more exciting, but our students were also so very excited to make their construction paper pizza as well and all the ingredients they need and what could represent chicken. Like there was a conversation in my class about what color paper they should use for chicken as it was very important that the chicken looked like real chicken. Um, as well, sorry, oh, as well as with our projects, we also use that voice and choice and students can demonstrate their learning in different areas. Like some students may put on a play, as you notice, um, I believe, yeah, there's a picture of some fourth or fifth grade students coming into a pre-K classroom and doing a reader's theater about what they've learned. Um, they might do a presentation with a poster board. It might be a song, as we're about to hear um, this year, that actually Miss Hoxie's daughter is in it, but um, we're really talking about safety and how to be safe in our new era, in the COVID era. And um, they created a song to, another song you might know, um, we'll see if you can guess the beat.
So, um, and this was something that we actually were able to do for our first virtual community meeting. So all the grades from pre-K to fifth grade were able to look at different, um, there was another, there was a few different song versions. There was um, some students sharing different pieces. So it's really just trying to share our learning and to teach others. And we really give the voice of choice to go back to that word, but the students the opportunity to be the expert of their learning. They teach us and we learn along with them. We're all lifelong learners. so we sometimes they ask us questions and we're like i don't know let's learn together so that's something that i really think is special and unique about riverside as well all right so the, another part of uh reggio amelia and something that we um really focus on at our school is using purposeful materials um, so in the younger grades um, oftentimes we talk about provocations um, which would mean that we're setting out materials um, as an invitation um, for children to really pay attention to noticing details and wanting them to become actively engaged um, and allowing children to explore ask questions and find answers so when we set out uh, these materials, there's not necessarily a set answer. We want children to really um, talk with one another, talk out their thoughts and ideas, um, and come up with conclusions. Also, adults are actively engaged. So when we say that there's student choice and voice, um, you know, there are I think sometimes we could say that we think that the children are dictating everything in the classroom. Um, that is not true. We still have routines and expectations. Um, but like Ms. Mish said, we want children um, to have a part in their learning because when you're using materials hands on um, around topics that you're interested in, you're more engaged. So um, really setting out materials for children to um, jump into their learning with those hands-on materials to kind of take those experiences to the next level with adults asking questions, um, but hoping that children will um, explore a little bit more to help find the answers themselves. And if they don't know, and we don't know, showing them, like Callie said, that um, we're lifelong learners and we don't have all the answers. So let's find out. Let's research. Um, so really, really using using our environment um, and the materials that we have in it to help um, reinforce what children are learning. I think um, something that we had noticed uh, in the beginning when um, we were just a pre-k k school like mrs kelly had said is that a lot of times people are using natural materials saying oh you do reggio so you don't there's nothing to do reggio as we said it's an inspiration when you think about um where the approach started that started where um in world war ii where there weren't a lot of materials uh, accessible to families so what did they use they used what was around them they used sticks uh they used rocks they used dirt and mud to explore, to still allow children to count, um, to learn shapes and letters and colors, to ask questions and find answers. And I think uh, even more so right now with COVID and having children um, at home and at school, we found this to be um, kind of circling back is that in the spring before we had the opportunity to really um, get children some of the materials that we're using here in school. We, you know, in preschool, we're, we're still learning to count and learning our shapes. Okay, well, we might not have some of the materials that we have here at school, but what can we utilize at home? And that goes back to um, what we were talking about in the beginning. Um, you know, you, you have stuffed animals, you have spoons that you're setting out um, for dinner you have Legos that you can count or sort. So um, really going, kind of tying that all in together. Sorry, I think I might be rambling a little bit. 
Um, so another thing that is very important here at RMS, besides all the hands-on um, project work and experiences, is technology. Um, it's an important part of our world. Um, so we give um, children the opportunity to use technology in a variety of ways. Um, children, um, pre-K students, I believe, um, all have iPads, and then the older grades are one-to-one -one Chromebooks. Um, and they... Um, use these uh, specifically in the class, but also while they are in library. So during library, they have the opportunity to um, kind of participate in our version of a maker space where they can collaborate and um, work together on activities for learning and exploring and sharing using both high-tech activities um, such as robots and low-tech activities such as building and creating with Legos. Um, so a couple examples of that are um, some of our older students have utilized um, a green screen and have um, filmed uh, videos, um, filmed videos on how to, um, like a how-to video or um, things like that. Um, students have also had the opportunities to do coding um, with robots in um, library. Um, and they've had the opportunities to learn about circuits and snap circuits. Um, and they've had the opportunity to use stop motion animation to animate stories or ideas. Um, and they have the opportunities to, like I mentioned before, use uh, many low tech um, activities such as Legos and magnet tiles, marble runs, and uh, various loose parts to display their learning as well. Sorry, I was starting to talk when I wasn't on mute, unmuted. Um, so one thing that we've really focused on this year is adapting to um, 2020. And uh, we know that parents have a lot of questions sometimes about what high, uh, COVID learning looks like and how that will play a role into the future. Um, our, at RMS, I can say that our teachers have really went above and beyond. Um, virtual teaching happens every day, lunch bunch um, time, so students while they're, eat, while they're learning at home will meet with teachers who are maybe out of school, maybe the teachers are at home if it's our virtual day on Wednesday. Um, we have social chat hours, so um, students can log on to their morning meeting earlier or at the end of the day before closing meeting and have like unstructured time with the teacher there listening, but um, to just chat with each other and catch up. We have some students who are online only learners and then we're currently in a hybrid style. So we have a cohort A and a cohort B. So these students aren't getting any um, chance to all interact together. So we're really trying to create that opportunity within our virtual thing. So you'll have Google Meets up and students will be chatting with each other. And they're like, oh, that's my friend from the other class, you know, on the other days. And we're like, no, we're all part of this one class. So we're really trying to create the classroom community this year, which is a little bit more challenging than in years past. But I think we're making some great progress. Um, it's also helped us a lot in building relationships with the parents. I know Ms., uh, Mrs. Kelly and Mrs. Simone both discussed how the parent is the first teacher. And this year, it's more true than ever. Um, we're really leaning on our parents and talking with our parents, talking about the curriculum, asking the parents like what things are they noticing at home. In our parent-teacher conferences um, just the other week, it was really a back and forth conversation and an exchange. Like what are you noticing at home? How can we provide support to you? What do you need? What do you need from us? What do you need from the school? And um, in some of mine, the reading specialist was there as well. And we just talked about how like books at children's levels in first grade aren't something that you can easily buy at the bookstore. Um, and they're not always even on the computer. So really like uh, the reading specialist came in yesterday and took a few of my students out and they went shopping in the hallway for books and just brought bags of books home to just read with their child. And the children will read and the parents will read and really just fostering that connection. And now we know what books they have. So we can send messages, hey, how is, one of the books that went home was fruitcakes because we had a discussion on what was a fruitcake. So how's fruitcakes going? Do you guys, are you guys enjoying that book? Um, so really we're trying to adapt and build that structure. Um, Listen, yes. I would love to jump in here because you said about teachers going above and beyond and really providing uh, families with what they need at home. And I know that in the spring and even now uh, with a hybrid model, we still have some children in online learning. You know, teachers are, obviously with precautions and safely uh, 
taking time on Wednesdays when children are not here in school to deliver materials to families um, so that children who are at home have the same um, ability to have access to the materials that children here at school are having. And I think that that's something uh, to be said about our staff and the relationships that they've created with uh, the families here, that they're you know, taking their time to go to each child's home and deliver some of those, uh, those materials. And I definitely, um, speaking to that, that in first grade, one of, sorry. Okay, sorry, there was just a message over the intercom. But um, one of the things that Ms. Simone just talked about is one of my first grade students, when they came back, their favorite memory for kindergarten was having their kindergarten teacher show up at their house. They were like, it's so cool. So it, it's even creating these lasting memories for the students as well in this dif different and difficult time. Um, and some of the other ways that we adapt at Riverside is by I just don't remember. Okay. We've really been taking our learning outdoors, which is something that um, is exciting. One thing that's great um, about the administration at our school as well is that it's not as so much structured with when to take your learning outdoors. They were basically like, take your learning outdoors. You know your students, your students have voice and choice, like work together to figure out when you're able to take your learning outdoors. So we're having reading breaks outside. Our music teacher has devoted a whole music studio outside, a music classroom, and they're playing instruments. And if you um, drive by our school on the highway, you'll be able to see some parts of it. You'll see students playing. I mean, anytime that you drive by during a regular school day, you'll see students outside learning. You'll see students playing on our playgrounds, but you'll also see students taking like scientific experiments, investigating, going on letter hunts with all the signs located around the school, going on movement breaks, taking mask breaks. I mean, you'll always just see students engaged in learning opportunities outside, which is something really exciting. And we're also using tools that are found outside. So when they go home, they can then apply that learning to their outdoor area. We also take mask breaks. Um, I mean, most schools, I think all schools right now are taking mask breaks. But they're structured into children's needs and wants. Like, what, what do you, we have this time in our day called win, what I need. And a lot of teachers have devoted it to mass breaks or literacy things. Like, what do the students in the class need and how can we support them? Some students you might see in some of these pictures, they're wearing their masks still during their mass breaks because some students feel more comfortable with that. Also with the mask breaks, we've been teaching them why we take mask breaks, why we wear a mask, and really doing the teaching of why it's important and revisiting that. I mean, after a few days off, students might have been home, not wearing their masks as much. So now we're reteaching those simple um, things and really talking and asking them their concerns and their fears and having these conversations about why it's important. All right, so some preschool specific um, details. Our class size uh, is two adults. So there's a certified teacher and instructor in each classroom uh, and 18 children. Uh, currently, um, as Ms. Mish said, we're, co we're in cohorts. So we have a cohort A and a cohort B. So about half of the children come on Monday and Tuesday and the other half come on uh, Thursday and Friday. Um, our daily schedule has in pre-K has not actually changed um, as much uh, due to COVID as we had originally thought. Um, so we still are having centers and small group time. Um, we have essentials, which is our specials here at Riverside, which include um, PE, music, art, library, and mindfulness. Um, so some of the small group time Time would include um, our curriculum, which is uh, in literacy, we're working uh, with a program called Foundations, which is introducing letters and letter sounds. Eureka is our math program. Second step is our social emotional program. And then we have exploration time. And something great about uh, the curriculums that we're using, Foundations, Eureka, and Second Step. Um, Eureka and Second Step start in pre-k and they continue um, all the way through to sixth grade and foundations um, is from pre-k to third grade and then um, fourth and fifth use um, a different program but i think something that's so important there is there's a common language um, from pre-k as they move forward um, you know we're really building off of 
the skills that they're starting um, at the foundation grades and moving forward, which I think is really special and unique about Riverside. Um, some additional information, um, this year everyone is eating in the classroom, but um, regularly in the non-COVID year, pre-K um, eats in the classroom. We do have a, re a daily rest time. Um, not all children sleep, but it is a time for them to relax their bodies, utilize some of that mindfulness that we're learning and just, you know, allow children to regroup. Um, and then a common question that we often receive from families, um, does my child have to be potty trained? As we encourage it, it is not required and we will work with families to help uh, with that process. Um, another big part of preschool, I think, is focusing on community um, and our social interactions, um, routines, and independence, and then really uh, allowing children to learn to communicate their thoughts and feelings. And I can answer some more specific pre-K questions when we get towards the end, if anyone has them. Um, so as uh, Ms. Mish, uh, Mrs. Kelly and Mrs. Simone have said, um, a large part of um, our community here at Riverside are, are our families um, and our parents and guardians. So we have invited two parent representatives here um, to talk a little bit about their experience here at Riverside. Um, so first we have um, uh, Tiffany Hoxie, and then we have um, Samantha Taylor. Um, they will be available at the end for questions. Um, Tiffany does have to run out to a meeting at one, um, so if she doesn't um, have the opportunity to answer any questions, uh, Sam Taylor can answer them for you. Tiffany? Sorry. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. My name is Tiffany Hoxie, and my daughter is um, in first grade. Um, we were here um, and she's home today, so sorry if she pops on and we're hearing noise, everything I've told her to in a, for a second, hi. but not yet, not yet. Let me just talk, okay? Sorry. So um, that that's kind of what I wanted to talk about was balance. So um, we were at RMS last year in kindergarten and now this year. And for her first year in kindergarten, we had a teacher change and we had a school shutdown in one year. And for somebody who's working, you know, I'm a working single parent, um, it was like a shock. <laughs> it was a shock. Not so much the teacher change, the school handled that quite well. But what I'm saying is, is that um, when, when the staff talks about creating that community and building relationships, and I said this before, they're like our, the family's biggest cheerleader because I didn't have to tell anybody anything um, and the school just knows that the children need these materials they need the support they need the communication they need to build relationships and they can do that in a million different ways but um, the first thing was the zoom calls or, or this and the seesaw activities and even if it was just a couple things while the administration was getting the uh, schedule together it still was immediate and Aviel didn't feel like she was abandoned. And I think that was, I, I know it's not just me, but that transition was huge um, because we went from learning the um, routine of school and getting on the bus and it's kindergarten, woo, it's all exciting and the bus stop and the kids at the bus stop. And, you know, there's just so many aspects to it that, um, you know, that you, that you, when you think about it now, um, you're really appreciative of, of the connection. So that was the first thing I wanted to talk about. Now, um, the, the balance is much easier because they were closed, you know, we were closed for a week or so last week and the week before. Now you're like, okay, <laughs> you know, I know what to expect. I know what to do. I know what I need to do for my schedule to support her learning at home. And I know if I ever have a question, I can just reach out to her teacher. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about with our experience was the, um, the student-driven aspect of the Reggio um, approach. Um, I'm in education myself, so I've been able to have a long-term experience learning about Reggio, which is in my favor, but for parents that don't, that student-driven learning 
is so, so important. And Aviel feels like she can go to school, she can make her choices, she can be given materials to um, create her own learning. Um, she has opportunities to, uh, for incentives if she does uh, well on certain things, but just being a kind, caring human, you know, she can uh, have incentives. And it's not materialized things. It's pick a go noodle that day. She's like, Woo go noodle. You know, it's just something simple, but that's what, that, that's what the, um, the the environment it's about you know what i mean it's it doesn't have to be something materialized you know they get excited um for just helping a friend and they get to have a lunch bunch with their favorite teacher or something so um those are the couple things that i that i thought were most um you know important for me to talk about it could go on and on but really the school is 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 on our side it's our biggest cheerleader and i know if i ever need anything i can just i can just ask so Thank you, Tiffany, so much. Uh, Sam? Yeah, so um, a lot of my same thoughts um, and experiences um, echo similarly to Tiffany's, um, but my two boys are in first and fifth grade and they have both been there um, since the beginning of their academic career. Um, and I think for us, Riverside is so special because of the strong community feel. Um, you know, it really almost feels like you're walking in, you know, you're walking into your home, you're with family, you're with people that you trust. Um, and I think that's, that's huge for us. Um, and the philosophy and the dedication of the teachers has really allowed for my children to uh, be successful learners. Um, they can be similar at times, but when it comes to their learning, I feel like they are two different uh, individuals. And throughout the years, their teachers have done a beautiful job of tailoring the way that they present curriculum or ideas or materials um, in a way that really works for my boys. Um, and they, they just love it. Um, and it's, you know, great to have complete trust in the school and the staff members. Um, I know Tiffany had mentioned it and I know, um, Lindsay, you had mentioned that the staff go above and beyond, um, to meet the needs, but they do that not only for the children, but for the families as well. Um, I know that if I, you know, shoot off an email because I'm in a frenzy because I can't find a Chromebook charger. Um, it happens regularly, but I do, <laughs> I do get a prompt response. Um, and, you know, there's always different solutions or trying to work through, you know, not only any problems that might arise for my kids, but for, for me as well. Um, and like Tiffany said, I think the COVID shutdown was a huge shock. Um, and, you know, we were, as parents, were just put at ease with how, um, you know, the staff handled it, the administration. Um, they definitely had our backs throughout all of it. Um, you know, and I'm constantly surprised at the creativity level of the activities that are being used, of the work that my children are bringing home. Um, I'm just always impressed with what's happening there. Um, and I'm constantly saying that really, you know, the teacher should get the credit for raising the kids because I feel, um, you know, like they are right there um, with the parents in every aspect. That's it. Like Tiffany, I could go on forever. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. We appreciate your kind words. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, so I took some information off of the RESCO website, which is up live now for um, lottery applications. Um, on the website, they have these little likelihood um, for an offer uh, tabs on there and it just gives you an idea of anticipated openings. Um, so for pre-K in general, we have about 35 slots every year. Um, we just, we get this question a lot from families. How many spots do you have? Um, that number, you know, is, uh, could change, um, but it's about 35 slots for pre-K. And as you get old in the older grades, um, there are less slots. Um, so that is the end of our formal presentation. We'd like to open it up uh, for questions, questions and answers. If anyone feels more comfortable, they can always type their questions and I have no problem saying them. Absolutely. And just feel free to just shout out if you, if, if that works for you as well. <laughs> I know we gave you a lot of information today. Casey, I'm wondering if, if we take the PowerPoint down so we can sure. see everyone. Absolutely. Thank you.
Also, if no one uh, has any questions that they can think of right off the bat, because sometimes it takes a little bit for uh, the information to settle in and digest and you think of questions afterwards, uh, we will be sharing Casey's um, email address. So you can always uh, forward her any uh, questions that you have after the fact. If it's something more specific to pre-K, um, she can always reach out to me and I can either email you directly or uh, respond back to her. And I know that um, Callie and uh, the rest of our team would be happy to, to help there also. Absolutely, I put my email in the chat, so in the chat box. So feel free to email me. Um, hi, I have a small question regarding PK. Sure. Hello. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, how how long are you planning to conduct the uh, online uh, sessions for them, pre-K? Can you say that last part one more time, please? No, no. Do you have the online sessions for the pre-K students? Uh, if you have them, uh, how long do you plan to continue them uh, in the next year as well? So online learning, we do pre-K is involved in online learning as well this year. Um, that really depends on I'm, Tanya or um, Kelly may be able to speak to that better, but it really depends on what the COVIDness of next year looks like for us as learners at school. Yeah, okay. so, so we are, um, th there are some families that have opted for online only, and, you know, we definitely honor that. Um, and then there are the two, the two smaller groups, the cohort A and the cohort B during the week. So we are very close, we are part of um, LEARN as the Regional Education Service Center um, that is our administrator. Um, so we are following all of the CDC guidelines, et cetera. Um, and so as a whole Regional Education Service Center, we put out our, our learning plans. Um, so we are just following you know, following along in terms of um, overall health and safety of our children. So things, things can change and we've adjusted to those changes. Okay, sure, thank we you. We want everyone back in school though. That is our goal, is to have everyone back in person. Oh, okay. There's also a question in the chat about um, sibling preference at CTRA. And is that the case? I wasn't sure of the answer. David, I'm going to have you take that one. Is David here? There you go. Okay, so for sibling preference, it applies uh, specifically to the school in which the individual currently is attending. However, if there is an opportunity to um, bring the individual um, through that pipeline, we will um, work with SDE to try to make that happen, but there's no guarantees. So I guess my question is, when I do her application, do I put in, because it asks if there's a sibling, if, what's, if there's a sibling who goes to one of the schools, so do I put in there that my older daughter goes to CTRA? Definitely. You do. <laughs> yes. Um, the way okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the state behind the scenes will cross-reference that because it is tied into Goodwin, but it's not a school-specific uh, preference that you're receiving. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Casey, I'm going to log off, okay? Thank you Thank for you, having Tiffany. me. Okay? Thank Welcome. you, Tiffany. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tiffany. Anytime. Bye. Any other questions? If not, we do have a short little video to show you. We um, got some, um, some of our students and staff to share why they love RMS. So we could show you that. And if you do think of a question, you can pop it in the chat. Or like we said, you can um, send me an email. Any other questions? All right, let's show our video. We hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is Kelly Gelino, and I am the assistant principal here at Riverside Magnet School. Why apply to RMS? Well, 
That's easy. We have an amazing school and community. Our scholars love our project-based learning and our amazing outdoor learning spaces and our caring staff. Our RMS scholars benefit from our nurturing environment based upon creating strong relationships within our community. You should definitely come join our RMS community. You won't regret it. Hello all, I am Mr. Clancy. I'm the PE teacher at Riverside Magnus School. Um, and I would like to encourage encourage families to have applied to have their children come to Riverside Magnus School. Uh, there are multiple reasons why you should do so. Um, one reason is all of our teachers are amazing. I've heard that Superman actually teaches at the school. Um, but also, the way our school has grown. I've been there for six years, and I started the PE program at the school, and to see the way it's developed into even now we have intramural sports programs after school um, for student interest, and then also to see we have school-wide events where uh, students lead those activities based off their interest, and just to see the development of, this, of the, our school and the development of the students that come to our school is just an amazing opportunity for our students, and I would encourage all families to apply to have their children come. Uh, IMS is one of the best schools you can possibly go to, and uh, you should send your kids to IMS because we have a wonderful staff, a great coordinator, and uh, a very helpful custodial staff like myself. And we're very funny, so you should send your kids to IMS. It's a clean school, and you learn a lot here. And also, it's a loving school, so everyone looks out for one another. You should come to my school because you get to go to recess and you get to have fun and you get to do your letters. What I like about RMS is that I like all the teachers I had in this year. And I like having all the fun activities that we can do. What I love about Riverside is I love my teachers. I love the location. I like making new friends. And I like my favorite subject is art. I love Riverside Magnet School because you make a lot of good friends and the teachers are very supportive. Also, they help you learn in a many different ways. Hi, Riverside Magnet School. Do you know why I love my my school because I love my teacher my I love my teacher I love my new teacher I love all my friends I love them so much. Hi, my name's Gabby and I love our mess because all the teachers teach us something new. Bye. Um, I like Riverside Magnet School because you can make a lot of good friends and they make math really fun and they make learning really fun and they get and we get to know words and we get to play and draw pixels and we get to do subtraction with bowling. My favorite thing about school is doing art and seeing my friends. Riverside Magnet School has a staff that take the time to figure out what learning style works best for your children, which for me is huge because I know that at the end of the day, both of my children are getting exactly what they need to foster a love of learning. I, lo I love my school because everybody nice. I'm Leo, and I grew up in Goodwin Magic School, and I really, really like about my school is I miss my friends, I love my friends. I like the security guards because they clean everything and I mean my school is really helpful. Bye. This is Martin. I love the Riverside Magnet School because my teachers are fun and, and I love learning a lot with my friends. One thing I like about my school and it is it's fun to play at. They're out the playground, and I get to learn new things in my school. I love uh, Riverside Magnet School because I learned how to read. What I like about RMS is that they have lots of fun activities, and it's easy to make friends.
school is very fun to learn because if you don't learn, how are you going to make it to this world? Well, yeah. And that's all I have. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly Gelino, and I am the assistant principal here at Riverside Magnet School. Why apply to RMS? Well, that's easy. We have an amazing school and community. Our scholars. That was awesome. just. Sorry, I was gonna say that was just a few words from some of our children in different grades from preschool all the way um, up, and we hope that you enjoyed that. Are there, are there any last questions before um, we say goodbye? All right, well, thank, thank you so much, guys. You're welcome. Thank, thank you for you. attending. Thank you. Thank have you. A great rest thank of you. your day. Don't thank hesitate. You so much. Reach out if you have any other questions.